Hey, what's up? Good to see you. We're going to try something new. I'm going to share all the things that I learned this week. I'm recording this on the 25th. In the two days, I turned 29. And I have a lot of opinions, for better or for worse. And I want to share those with you here today. Now, if you don't know who I am, I'm Summer Healy. I've been building businesses since I was literally a kid. I mean, really, when I was like 14, 15 is when I got serious. I currently run three businesses today. Our land flipping operation, landpioneer.com, landinvestor.co, which is our coaching outfit. I've helped over 298 people in the last year or so. And then Land Insights, which is our software for land investors. So yeah, you know, I got some things to talk about. So if you guys like this format, leave me a comment down below. Let me know. I'd love to do more of these. Recap the things that I learn every week. And this is really more for me than anyone else, but maybe it helps. So let's talk about it. One of the things I've been reminded of, I feel like I get reminded of this so often, is the ability to think in decades and not days. And the reason that this comes up for me often is that, you know, having hundreds of people a year go through Leah, statistically, of course, you're going to get some people that just don't understand the level of work that's required, right? People that are coming in, they're looking to throw a Hail Mary. And as much as I try to not talk like that in my marketing, as much as I try to set proper expectations, people still forget that while we have a very prescriptive model, while we essentially have you know, the franchise model of land investing, like really a business in a box, this is still, as the name implies, a business. This is freaking hard. You're an entrepreneur. You're not someone that's just inside a coaching program that just follows to a T and happens to get results. Shit's still going to get hard. You're going to hit speed bumps. You're going to get dinged up here and there. That really never goes away. I've been building businesses for a while. It still happens to me almost every day, at least every week, you just learn how to handle it better. You learn both from like a psychological standpoint, but also just a strategy to overcome problems and just solve them really quick. Yeah, that's really what being an entrepreneur is, right? It's like, can you deal with uncertainty and the ambiguity and not get your frame of mind all jazzed up or get your frame of mind all down and keep your composure and then figure out solutions. And usually figuring out solutions just happens from, from testing. But anyways, what I see, and it's just really frustrates me is people that think this is somehow going to be easy and it's simple, but it's not easy. And they get flustered or frustrated when they hit speed bumps or they get flustered and frustrated just when life happens, right? You've got other obligations, things come up and I'm not calling out one person in particular, but in our whole coaching career, there have been three people that have fallen into this category and we've done everything in our power to get them back on track. And so far we have been able to revive every situation, but these people that try to throw in the towel because it's too difficult. Now, if I was thinking in terms of decades, I wouldn't be so worried about racing to this finish line. I think a lot of times people feel this pressure or this FOMO, seeing what others are doing. And they imagine that if they're not keeping pace with that, they start to kind of frown upon the work they're doing. And then of course you start to not enjoy it. And you put too much pressure on yourself. When you're thinking in decades, I don't really care at the speed at which I'm going. As long as I'm chipping away daily and I'm moving the needle slightly forward, that's all I care about. And I don't play comparison games. There's people that are way, 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 way ahead of me. If I was comparing my speed to their speed, I would look at my whole situation from a negative purview. If I was to, I look at my situation from a place of gratitude and I don't make comparison games. I know I'm playing the game of business for forever, for a long time. And so if it's an infinite game and there really is no final destination, what are you tripping on? <laughs> what are you so worried about? Uh, this is a lifetime pursuit, whether it's land or not, being an entrepreneur is a lifetime pursuit. So get comfortable with that. And I find a lot of comfort knowing that this is a game that lasts forever. There is no final destination. There's no speed that I have to go at. There's no timeline. As long as I chip away day after day, good things will happen. As some of you guys might know, if you're inside of our Discord, on Friday of last week, I lost my beloved dog, Sequoia. She was the love of my life. I actually got her tattooed right here with her birthday. She was the best thing that's ever happened to my girlfriend and I. And we love this dog as if she was our, our own, as if she was our kin. She was in a lot of ways, our child. I mean, she was both kind of a helpless dog, a little English bulldog, but also, you know, we're in that part, that stage in our life where that paternal, maternal instinct is starting to come out for us. So having something to caretake and love and protect, we found so much fulfillment in it. And we got blindsided. I mean, within 24 hours, she was dead. Kidney failures and the cysts growing in her neck and a whole bunch of other things. And she spent her last day in the hospital and we had to make the really, really hard decision to end her life because there was a lot of suffering involved there and really hard decision to make. And honestly, I mean, it's a horrible thing for me to think about seeing her on the operation table in pain with the gross. And yeah, it's a really, 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 really hard thing to think about. And it was a really, really, really hard day. And it's been honestly a really, really, really hard week. The interesting thing is like everything in life is on balance. So there's a lot of pain there. There's a lot of darkness there. The irony is that there's also a lot of love on the other side of that. While this has been a really painful week for me, there's also been a lot of silver linings. There's been a lot of gratitude. There's been a lot of reminiscing on the good times and recognizing how thin the veil is of life and death. And what it's got me thinking about is our perception or our understanding of death in Western culture is so limited. It's so ignorant. The fact that we only label death as a bad thing. How do we know death is a bad? What if that is the next? What is that is, is the ascension? What if all of this is just working up to that? You know, I keep on thinking maybe my beautiful dog Sequoia was needed somewhere else in a different realm or universe or dimension or whatever 
whatever you want to call it, or heaven. You know, maybe she was needed somewhere else. And I find a lot of comfort in that. And it just started to get me questioning our views on death and why we only view it as a negative. Yeah, it might be a negative in this 3D existence because we're losing the thing that we love. But how limited is our perspective there? And I think other cultures might have a better grasp on death. But in the Western world, ever since a little kid, we've been conditioned to think it's the worst thing that's ever going to happen to us. I got down this rabbit hole looking at pet sidekicks, which we're, we're hiring one, which who knows if it's real or not, but someone to help us communicate, but also going down the rabbit hole of like near death experiences. And the stories are fascinating. If you've never watched or listened to any of these, I highly recommend it and listen to a handful of them because you realize people from all different walks of life and all different situations happen to them. Their stories have these very, very, very similar parallels. And the biggest theme that I saw is everyone that goes to the next stage, they don't want to come back. And when they, whatever in that situation, when they recognize that this is not a permanent thing and they're going back to the 3D material world, there's a real, I don't want to leave this because we live in a world that's full of duality. It's good, bad, it's dark light. What if that other world is non-dualistic? What if it's just good, you know? So there's just so much we don't know there. And I find a lot of comfort reveling in my ignorance around death. And again, the beauty of these things is that they're all over the map. I'm going to share whatever the heck is on my mind. The third one is around sales training. I think sales training is one of those things that you feel like if you're the owner, operator, CEO, you start to outgrow. No, nah, that's not really important. Or maybe you hire salespeople, you train them in the beginning, you cut them loose and you say, you know, see you later, you do your thing. And I was that guy for a long time, right? I'm pretty heavy on training, but I gave way too much breathing room, both in really in, in all three of the businesses. And so I've had a revelation this month going back through and getting really deep in the weeds, reviewing dozens or really hundreds of calls at this point, hours and hours and hours of sales training and role playing every week. Now, I think we've gone you know, way far to one side because we had so much ground to make up. Literally within seven days, the results are, I mean, we're night and day in all of this, night and day. Unbelievable, unbelievable the difference. And it got me thinking, you know, sales training is one of those things that's actually so high leverage. It's so high ROI because I like to think about things where I don't have to work harder, but I get a better result. So imagine this, we sales train for an hour. My team was already going to take those calls thereafter. The unit of work by taking those calls, but now they're just better, right? That's high leverage to me. And that's actually really high ROI for my time as well. And while I'm not a sales expert, I'm a subject matter expert. Like I, few people could talk land like I can, both on the coaching side and on the software side and within our own land business. And so there's a subject matter expertise that I get to relay to my team. And I'm not a big like hard closer sales guy, but I'm a tactical guy. Like if you get on a call with us on the Leah side, landinvestor.co slash apply, we get tactical, we get it in the weeds. Sometimes that repels people, but if that repels you, you're the wrong person. If you find like, well, that connects, like, well, I'm a technical dude. I want something that's prescriptive, that resonates and attracts the right people. And so really everything about our sales process is pretty technical and then super, super rapport based. Even if you are the only salesperson, even if you're the everything on your team, you're a one man band, review your calls, role play, workshop objection handling. On a lot of these calls that we've been doing for all the businesses, and it's taken up a ridiculous amount of time. But again, the effects have been immediate. What we do on these calls is we review call recordings. We call prospects live. We do role playing between us and the sales team. We do objection handling. So we'll talk about this objection comes up. Here's how I would handle it. And we work on the mindset. This is a high performance game. It's really a sport. So it's all up and down. And it's such a reflection of where you're at. If you're not bringing clean, clear, excited energy to your calls, good luck. I don't care if you've got the best script ever. Energy is transferable. And so making sure your team's right in the right headspace and I think that like just knowing that we're all in this together and working through it together, even that adds a layer of motivation because they're no longer siloed alone. So again, we've swung to an extreme. I don't know if we're going to do the same level of sales training that we've been doing, but it will for sure be once a week for the time being. And that will be with me for across the board, all three businesses. It's a lot of work, but it's, it, I mean, it's just been shocking. And as I've been reminded that really every business that I'm in is a sales business. Everyone says it's a sales and marketing business. I really think it's more of a sales business. How you get people in the door doesn't really matter that much, especially in land. You want to text them, you want to RPM them, you want to cold call them, you want to do direct mail, whatever. But once they are in, the magic is made about how you connect, how you unearth what the problems are and how you solve them or help solve. Number four is land insights is literally the biggest unfair advantage in land right now. And I know you're probably saying, Sumner, you're so biased. Of course, you're so biased. Look, I'm gonna tell you something. Our team has been using this. Everyone on our team has been using it. We are saving about four hours a day right now, collectively from our team using it. Four hours a day. That's unbelievable. We're talking about 20 hours hours a week, talk about 80 hours a month. That's just on the time savings component, right? We're shaving our marketing costs by 40% through our scrubbing pools. We're taking what used to take hours and hours and hours to find a good market. We're doing that in 15 or 20 minutes. I mean, it's a ridiculously unfair advantage. And I see it from the people that are using Land Insights. We've got members that have taken their days on market 60 days to 17 days, just by finding better markets. People have taken their response rate from a third of a percent to, you know, right under 1%, you know, 0.9%, 0.89%. We've had people that have shaved their market research time from 10 to 15 hours a week to 30 minutes a 
week. I mean, the list just goes on. And so it's a tool that not only saves time, which that is awesome, but it's a tool that again, is a force multiplier. You don't work harder. In fact, you work less, but you get a better result. So imagine you're going to go send marketing to fill in the blank county. It costs you the same thing, but I go market to a better county, costs me the same thing, but our results are wildly different. I get a higher response rate. I get more deals. My ROAS is higher. I sell my deals faster. Force multiplier. There is still one unit going in, but more units going on the back end. And I'm obsessed with leverage. That's why we always talk about ROAS in this business. To me, that's leverage. The more I can make without having to put more into the machine, that's more leverage. And I'm obsessed with it. And that's one of the reasons I love business. I love creating systems that have leverage. And leverage is what allowed humans to advance. Think about literal levers and pulleys and systems that allow us to carry more weight than we ever could just by holding or carrying something or picking it up. Leverage is the secret to growing businesses. There is no tool out there like Land Insights right now. It is just a ridiculously unfair advantage. Honestly, I feel like it's kind of going to be like an NFT. Like we are going to have to cap the total number of seats on the tool. We're not going to be raising price, but we are going to be capping the number of seats. And if someone loses their seat and they go, I don't, I'm not going to use this anymore. Good shot. They'll never get back in. Right. And so that's like, there's like a real cap supply and hell. Maybe people resell the seats for more than they paid. And it really is an NFT. I don't know, but there's something really interesting in that model committing to not raising price outside of inflation. That's the one thing. If in 10 years from now, inflation's rampant and it's like $500 a month is like $5 a month. Okay. We'll have to adjust. But despite continuing to ship new features and new products every two weeks, we do not increase the price. That's kind of like our commitment to people. And we have marketplace features inside where people can actually get discounted pricing to run some of our scrubs and some of the additional tools that we're adding. But it's like the Costco model, right? Someone goes and pays a flat monthly fee and then gets huge discounts on some of the internal features. But it's like 1% of the features actually have that marketplace function. And so we've got some really cool new stuff that we're adding to it, including the ability to scrub out kind of ownership uh, records that you never want to market to. This is a free scrub. So removing things like farms, funerals, railways, elementary, universities, towns, townships, credit, pg &E, like all those classic things that end up in your data that we know we don't want to mark to, that people are literally manually picking through their, their data sets to clean up or worse, they are doing that. <laughs> They're just not scrubbing it at all. So we've got a lot of like really cool free features. We remove duplicates for free and all that jazz. The next idea that's been coming to mind is like the real power of making money, the power of having money. So you don't have to think about money. I think a lot of people fall into the trap of making money and then they get so fixated on keeping the money, on more money, on always like growing their, their nest egg or growing their income. That's a trap. That's a real danger. You know, it's funny, like growing up, we didn't have much money. You know what we did? We fixated on money. We thought about money a lot or our lack of it. That's stressful. Why do you want to continue that thinking? Okay. If you have the good fortune and you have the luck and the ability to generate an income that satisfies you and your family, the goal is to not think about money anymore. That's the real benefit. That's the real joy. Growing up around folks that where money was so tight, it was this constant plague. It was this constant thought. You don't want to live there. Now you shouldn't worship money. Worship money shouldn't be like the end all be all. It's a tool. One of the biggest benefits from that tool is the ability to not think about it, to kind of put that out of your mind and put that to rest. Now, I'm sure people will say, well, some of that's easy for you to say, or da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I understand that. I've got a high level of privilege. I'm incredibly lucky. I've been incredibly blessed. I don't take the credit for the most of the things in my life. And I, I want to make that really, really clear. But I still think a lot of people fall into this trap. Maybe you're not making a lot of money today. That's okay. But what if you are in 10 years and you get into that vicious loop of driving all meaning and purpose from the chart going up, whether it's in your bank account or, or revenue or whatever, that's a trap in my opinion. It's a trap worth avoiding. Number six, and the last one on this list is learning to think like an entrepreneur. Now, what does that mean? I think that a lot of people that get into land or get into these biz op programs or teach you how to run a business, they, they fall into this trap of trying to learn the strategy, right? So it's like, that's what's important. It's the technique, it's the strategy, it's the new marketing channel you're going to learn about. That stuff actually means little. I think it's helpful. And I think in the beginning, yes, you need a playbook, you need strategy. And that's why Leah is so successful is because we've got a very prescriptive ABCD type strategy that people follow. But the real level up from there is twofold. One, it's your ability to think like an entrepreneur and understand the foundations of being an entrepreneur and building businesses. The second is your ability to keep a cool mind, cool head, but your ability to compose yourself and weather the storm and stand in the fire and not let it affect your day to day life, not let it affect your decision making. Now to think like an entrepreneur, you need to think like a scientist. Okay. Everything is a game of saying, hey, there's a bunch of different options here. I don't know what option is going to work for us. So let me test, 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 collect the data. You start with the hypothesis and then you make decisions off the data. That's it. And so I see a lot of people that get flustered. Oh, XYZ marketing channel isn't working anymore, or they're going to stop texting or double closing in South Carolina doesn't work anymore. So what? That is the, that is the rule, not the exception. Like that is life is building businesses. It, you're always in this perpetual game of change to stay in front of it. You need to be constantly coming up with hypothesis and testing and collecting feedback. Now, there are other things that involve being an entrepreneur, but in the beginning, that's the skill set. Hypothesis, test, collect data, make decisions off the data. And then as once you're in the thick of it, shit's going to start breaking. Things are going to stop working. 
Okay, marketing channels are going to dry up. Competition is going to come in. And you leverage that same ability to say, okay, this isn't working. Data is telling me. New hypothesis, data, test feedback, and just keep on doing that. Like that is the game. People, both talent, both customers, like you need to be able to lead people. It's one of the most valuable skills is can you bring a vision to people? Again, it could be prospects, could be sellers, could be buyers, could be your team members. Can you inspire people? Because the truth is you're not going to go this road alone. That's an advanced skill set. That might not be required day one, or maybe it is, but you need to figure out how to communicate and how to connect. You need to figure out how to have empathy. And empathy is one of those things I think is wildly misunderstood. Empathy allows us to put ourselves in the shoes of our customers and think about what do they need? What would they want? Same thing for our team. So people always have this like weird view of entrepreneurs as being like these pig headed, aggressive, thoughtless characters that just could try to fill up their own buckets. And I'm sure there are people out there like that, but they are some of the most well thought out empathetic people I know, because that's what's necessary to lead. You need to be leading from a place of empathy. You need to be able to put yourself in the shoes of others. Now that's again, maybe a more of a high level skill set, but it's the scientific skill set. It's the empathy and it's the leadership. And the last is being able to fucking weather the fucking storm. What the fuck are you made out of? I see so many weak ass people out there. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. I don't care what your circumstances are. There are people that have had it way worse than me. People that have it way better than me, right? Like pain is pain. It's all relative, just what you know. But goddamn, you are a human. Like your ancestors went through trials and tribulations for you to even exist. They are the strong ones. They weathered storms to survive. And nowadays our life is so cushy. It's so perfect. People have lost that inner savage in them. They've forgotten the fact that it wasn't that long ago that you would die at 30 years old. I mean, you might die of hunger. Your kids might die. When you didn't, maybe you didn't even have a shelter and a storm rolls. So I mean, like life has been a freaking nasty, nasty son of a gun to humans since the dawn of time. It's only in the last 100, 150 years that life is how we know it today. And life is going to continue to get better and people are going to continue to get softer unless they are conscious of it and they put their feet to the fire. And there's few things in like, like business that will put your feet to the fire and will challenge you. So call yourself out. Are you soft? And if you are, look at this not so much as an exercise in making money. Look at this as an exercise in developing yourself, right? I think entrepreneurship is like this mirror that reflects back our weaknesses. And it gives us a real perspective on who we are and where we're falling short and what we're good at. But it allows us to see some of our, our inner flaws and start working off them. I've learned so much. I mean, I think the two biggest teachers in my life have been business and relationships. Those are the ultimate reflection of where I am struggling and where I can improve in my blind spots. And so use this as an exercise for your self-development and call yourself out. If you are a softy, that's okay. You don't have to remain a softy. I need you to, man or woman, I don't care. I need you to pull your pants up, put your boots on, tie them tight and get out there. No place for complaining, okay? This is not the place. Business, there is no room for complaining, okay? You just, you do, you learn, you adapt, you do. And it's just that feedback loop over and over. All right, guys, take care of yourself.